Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. They intended evil for him, and God, through his providential hand, worked in Joseph's life to where now he's second in command in Egypt, and he's going to be really the agent and, and the, the person used to help preserve the people of Israel. And this is that Old Testament counterpart of the providential hand of God. Listen to Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. It says, as for you, talking to his brothers, Joseph says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, and this is the present result, to preserve, that's the key word, to preserve many people alive. And if you may remember, if you were with us last week when we looked at the idea of a goel or a redeemer, a large part of what it meant to be a goel or a redeemer was to preserve. And we see in that story, Joseph is that agent of God to be able to be a part of the preservation of the people of God. But ultimately what we find is that God is our goel. God is our preserver, our redeemer, the one that is going to take care of us. And so my hope is that as we conclude this study here this morning, is that you have just the eyes to see, the ears to hear, that's exactly what's taking place in the conclusion of our study. But before we jump in, let's pray together. Father, asking that this morning that we may trust in your, in your seen and unseen hand, uh, that we would know that, that you are at work around us, um, and that, we would be, that would be evident to us. Uh, may we know that you are personally our, our Redeemer. And if you would, where you're sitting right now, I know there's a lot of things going on over the weekend, that kind of thing. Would you just pray and just ask the Lord to to give you the attention that you need to to conclude this study and take the truth with you as you go into this week? And if you would, would you pray for me that I'll be a help to you with what the Lord has for us today? Well, Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, As we've done the last few weeks in order to kind of get us all kind of back together, because we're going to the end of Ruth, we're in Ruth chapter 4, just to give you a little bit of review and context. If there's a key word for each of these chapters or each of these acts of this story that we've seen in Act 1 or in Ruth chapter 1, the key word is that word chesed. It's that Hebrew word that I've presented to you multiple times at this point, but it's that Hebrew word that encompasses so many different ideas in the English language of compassion and loyalty and mercy and kindness and faithfulness, all wrapped up into this one Hebrew word. And we see that throughout chapter one, even though in chapter one, we find that two of our key characters, Naomi and Ruth, have experienced incredible loss, have had incredible heartache. The, this, the book of Ruth opens really with a funeral, if you will, and it's going to conclude with a wedding. It's going to be this beautiful, beautiful picture. But, but you see this great loss that Naomi and Ruth have. Naomi loses her husband. She loses her two sons. Ruth, who is the daughter-in-law to Naomi, she also loses her spouse. And Ruth is actually going to be traveling out of the land that she's in and going into the promised land with Naomi. She's abandoning father, country, everything to go into uh, the land of Israel. And as they do, they are without provision, they're without protection, they're without food, they're without family. And that's kind of how chapter one concludes. But if, but if, if you're not careful, you could be like Naomi and just be like, man, God has just put them through the ringer. This is so difficult. Or you could also see that the providential hand of God, the unseen hand of God and his chesed, his kindness is still throughout even the heartache and even the difficulties that Naomi and Ruth are experiencing in a sin-soaked world. So we jump into chapter two. In chapter two, that key word was favor. Favor, or you might think of grace. And you have Ruth who is saying to her mother-in-law, Naomi, we, we need food. <laughs> we, 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 we need family, but ultimately we need food right now. We got to eat. And so she goes to the fields. And as we saw in that study, she just so happened, she chanced upon chance to go into, of all the fields and all the world, she goes to Boaz's field to glean. And as she shows up there, Boaz notices her. He even says to the remark to his kind of lead employee, he says, who woman is that? Like he wants to know who this lady is. And he's, he's quite even taken with her, maybe even initially attracted to her. And we see their first date in Ruth chapter two, and just the provision and protection that Boaz provides in Ruth's life. And Ruth prayed, hoped for at the beginning of chapter two for favor. She experienced, she found favor in the person of Boaz and gleaning in his field. But then she got to experience continual favor. Like she got what she prayed for, which was favor, which was grace. And then last week was chapter three. In chapter three, that key word was goel. 
It's that word, it's that Hebrew word of redeemer, kinsman redeemer. And what we saw last week is we saw this, well, we started with Naomi giving some, I would say, questionable and shady advice to her daughter-in-law of how to pursue a guy. It's not something that we're going to write a book about of this is how you do this, ladies. This is not the case. But God and his, again, his, his sovereign hand, his work, uh, Ruth and Boaz have have this moment here on the threshing floor where they're, they're visiting, they're talking, and basically Ruth is letting it be known that she says, hey, I'm available. You're a kinsman redeemer. Uh, she's not so much proposing as she's like saying, if you would want to propose, uh, I'm here. And so what we have is, <clears throat> is Boaz, he, he says, your chesed, your kindness is greater than even what we fought, saw before in your kindness to your mother-in-law, Naomi. And he's drawn to her he wants to redeem her, but what happened was last week, and it was so funny because when we got finished and eventually when Tiffany and I got home, she said, I, I literally, I almost, when you got to the end of chapter three, I almost went, no, finish it, just finish it because you are kind of left on this cliffhanger of Boaz says, I want to redeem you. I want to marry you. Man, I am drawn to you, and she seems to be drawn to him, but there's always that but in a good story, but there's one who is a closer relative than I. And if this is going to be legit, what I'm not going to do is do anything shady or underhanded. I have to go and make sure that the law is fulfilled. And that brings us to Ruth chapter 4 of what will happen. How will this story conclude? And some of you have read it, but again, as I told you, stop reading Ruth and just wait so that we can all enjoy it together. Uh, And so what we have is we get into Ruth chapter 4. And, and uh, as we do, we're, we're just going to go as we have, just kind of verse by verse, and just kind of hopefully kind of sitting in and being in the midst of this scene, in the midst of this story. So look at chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate, and he sat down there, and behold, the close relative, the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, of whom Boaz spoke, was passing by. Uh, now, I'm going to stop there, and I know that makes you nervous because we've only gotten through like half of a verse, but just hang with me. Uh, just to give you a little bit of context, because this is foreign to us. You might say, well, why is Boaz going to go to a gate? Well, the gate in, in most towns, this is where business was conducted. This was the marketplace. This is where business happened. Legal proceedings happened. So that's why he's going to, to the gate uh, of, of, of the city and of the town. So that way he can do, this, do what he needs to do legally and above board. And this is where you would do this. This is the proper setting, place, and time. The other thing is, again, this is a moment where we see not coincidence, but providence, Again, the, the, the writer of the book of Ruth is using the similar language as, uh, as they did in chapter 2 of where Ruth just happened to go into Boaz's field to glean. This is that similar language of Boaz is at the gate and it just so happens that the, the guy that he's waiting for just happens to pass by. It's, again, the unseen providential hand of God. And I know for a lot of us, what we want to experience in our life, and I get it, we want the dividing of the Red Sea. We want the burning bush to show up in our life and for that burning bush to say, you know, take this job, move here, do this thing. That's what we want. We want God just to be explicitly clear. And those miraculous supernatural moments, I believe that they do happen and God can speak to us and reveal things to us. But we also have to recognize that the unseen hand of God is at work. And maybe, maybe at this time in your life, you're wondering, God, where are you? And it's when we have to rely not upon our feelings, but upon the truth of Scripture. And I would even say, look back at the history of your own life and your own relationship with the Lord to know, though I don't feel it, I believe your unseen hand is at work, regardless of how I feel. And that's a difficult place to be. That's a difficult truth to to, to receive, but it is still the truth. And so, It says, Boaz says to him, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and he sat down. And then Boaz, verse two, he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. And so what Boaz is doing is is he's gathering together what is needed in order for this legal situation to be taken care of. And he seems to even have a little bit of an initiative uh, for this to happen. He needed 10 elders to be basically witnesses of this situation. So that way it's not just two guys just over here saying, yeah, we'll do this, we'll do that. There needed to be witnesses of this situation in order for it to be legal, in order for it to be above board and above, uh, beyond reproach. So verse three, then he said to the, to the closest re- relative, to the kinsman redeemer, he said, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, 
has to sell the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought to inform you, saying, Buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, just note how many times the word redeem is mentioned in these verses. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am after you. And this man says, I will redeem it. This is that moment in the film where you're watching this and you just start throwing things at the screen. You're like, that's not how it's supposed to go. The guy, Boaz is supposed to be the nice guy who's above board, above reproach. And is like, hey, here's a situation. And because the, the way it should be is that, that I get the girl that you're not supposed to say I will redeem it. I'm just doing the right thing, the nice thing. But really, I'm just doing this because, because I want the girl. But you weren't supposed to say that. But what I love about Boaz is there is, I believe, I believe he lives out that phrase and that verse that we hear Jesus speak in the Gospels, that we are to be innocent as doves and shrewd as, some of you knew, serpents. Uh, and, and sometimes we've wrestled with, are we supposed to be shrewd as serpents? I don't like snakes, and I don't want to be characterized as one. So why, why is that in there? And there's this sense of sometimes not all the time, but sometimes within the Christian faith, if we're not careful, we allow ourselves to go, oh, well, I believe you're above board, and we don't want any kind of contractual thing other than just my word is my word, and I'll give you a handshake. And I've seen brothers, and I've seen sisters in the faith who have just been completely taken advantage of because, well, I want to be as innocent as a dove. And that's good, but there's two sides of that coin of that you still need to be a good businessman or woman. It doesn't mean that you take uh, the heart out of business. I've heard some people say, oh, it's just business, and they do whatever they want. That's just taking one extreme of that coin uh, too far down the road. It's that you're both and. Boaz is being above board. He's letting this guy know, this is available for you. But what we're finding, he's also being quite shrewd. The way in which he even presents and communicates this scenario is he's like, hey, there's a parcel of land that all you got to do is just redeem it and buy it. You'll help out our, our relative Naomi. And the guy's just like, this is a no-brainer situation. I think Boaz recognizes that it would, it would not make sense for him to say, I will redeem it. But then Boaz comes in and says, well, I know you said that, but before you go too fast, look at verse 5. Then Boaz said, okay, you're going to redeem it, will you? Well, on the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, uh, you also must acquire Ruth the Moabitess. That's the record scratch for this guy. If you're watching this movie, his eyes get kind of big, and he's like, uh, I didn't know that was a part of the deal. You must acquire Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. Man, this... This is a moment that just catches this guy off guard. Because listen to what he says, verse 6, the closest relative, the kinsman redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself because I would jeopardize my own inheritance. So he looks to Boaz and he says, redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption for I cannot redeem it. Man, I, I didn't even give you the first point, so you can write this down in your notes. Sorry about that, Dalton. <laughs> But the very, very first point is just Boaz redeems Ruth. I know it's profound, but it's that simple. So just hopefully that helps you remember it. Boaz redeems Ruth. That's what we see in these opening verses. Like he goes about the work of what it takes to redeem her. And some of you will remember, and I even put it in the newsletter this past week, and uh, there's a handful of you that got the answer right, and I need to get you your, your, your prize. But a few of the different qualifications to be a kinsman redeemer, some of you may remember is, first of all, you just had to be a relative. Well, this guy that has no name and Boaz are part of the family, the clan, the tribe of Elimelech, Naomi's deceased husband. So they have that first qualification down. They are, they are relatives. The second qualification is you have to have the, the ability, uh, or excuse me, the, yeah, the ability or the means to be able to make the rede redemption happen. You have to have kind of the wealth and the money to actually purchase something in order to redeem it. Because it's not just that the redemption of the person was taking place, the land was being purchased, the land of Elimelech. So that way it didn't just get squandered off, like it needed to be preserved. Because again, for the nation of Israel, the land meant so much, like that was a big deal. But then the third thing is you had to have the desire. 
And in this instant, the guy had a desire for a moment because he wanted the land, but he didn't want the person. He didn't want the wife. He didn't want Ruth. And it could have been for a variety of different reasons. Commenters have speculated on what it possibly could have been of why he's like, no, 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 no. It might have been that he was a married guy and he's like, I'm not taking on another wife and have to be intimate with her in order to produce offspring. Like, I'm not doing that. And if I do this, it's going to really mess with the inheritance that I already have, maybe for my family and my children. If I do this thing, it's just going to get all kinds of messy. Like, it's just not something that that I'm going to, to do. Other commenters have said, just know how many times he uses the word I and me and my and all of like the the first person kind of pronouns of like he's all about himself and he's not thinking about the other. Regardless of what the reason is, God's hand is at work. This is not the guy that is intended to be the one who will preserve and redeem Ruth and Naomi. It's it's going to be Boaz. And and before we continue, I mentioned this last week that to be a goel, to be the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer, as we just said, you got to be the relative, you got to have the ability, the means to redeem, uh, you also have to have the desire. What's interesting to me is Boaz goes into this situation and he knows that I, ha- I qualify for all of those, but in order for it to be legit and not shady and not underhanded, I, I have to make sure that the law is fulfilled. And you'll see that that's exactly what happens. Look at at verse 7. He says, now this was the custom in former times. This is the author of Ruth trying to give us a little commentary explanation. He says, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another, and this was the manner of attestation in Israel. So the closest relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, and he removed his sandal, and then that's when people in the theater went, hooray, and they started clapping and cheering. And so then it says, then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and to Malon. Moreover, here it is, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the, de- the name of the deceased on his inheritance so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. Then all the people who were in the court and the elders said, we are witnesses and may the Lord Yahweh make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ep- Epaphrath and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, your house... May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. Before we move on to the next thing, just to kind of hopefully illustrate some of this. When we get to the end of chapter 3, Boaz has every desire to want to redeem Ruth. But things have to be done in a certain process and order. There's work that needs to be done in order for the redemption to happen. And particularly, the law has to be fulfilled. As I told you last week, you can go to Leviticus 25, Deuteronomy 25, and it talks about the Leverite marriage, and it talks about uh, the kinsman redeemer, and that there are certain customs and laws that had to be kind of fulfilled for this to happen. And we can see that Boaz is going through all of this as kind of like a, kind of like a business transaction. There's the removing of the sandals, so everything is being above, above board is being done legal. But here's the thing. As much as Boaz wanted to redeem Ruth, he couldn't do it until the work was done and the law was fulfilled. In in my life, in in Tiffany and I's life personally, some of you know a little bit of our story, but when we had an opportunity to go through in a domestic adoption, as much as we were excited and put the work and the energy in to, if you will, redeem and bring this little girl into our home from the hospital, We were excited, our hearts were pure, our hearts were good, and we did all the work that we could, spent a ton of money and a ton of time in order for this redemption to take place and for her to come to be a part of our family. She even lived in our home for a couple of weeks and was cared for and taken care of and fed and changed and held and loved. But here's the thing, as much as you want it, if the law is not fulfilled, that doesn't mean that you just get what you want. The law has to be fulfilled. The judge did not sign or stamp that she is yours. 
Therefore, she was not ours. As much as Ruth and Boaz were like, I want this to happen, the law had to be fulfilled. And it took Boaz doing everything, doing the work to fulfill the law in order to redeem the woman. I think you see where I'm going. It took Jesus Christ to do the work upon the cross and to fulfill the completion of the sacrificial system that we read in Leviticus and the high priest and the prophet and the king. All of this stuff that we see in the Old Testament is ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus to where even at the beginning, his thesis statement on the Sermon on the Mount, which we went through last year, when he comes along and he says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law because the law is good, but it needs to be fulfilled. There's got to be someone who could come along in this world and do what no man could do. Adam failed at it, and every man and woman has failed at it since. We have all violated and broken the law, so no one can be the Redeemer until someone fulfills and lives up to the totality and the goodness of the law, and that person is Jesus Christ. And so he comes along and says, I've done the work. I am able, capable to redeem. And that's exactly what he does. And this is the thing. Sometimes people will go, man, I want, I want to be saved, and I want to go to heaven, and so will you redeem me? Jesus has done the work, but again, Ruth has to receive the redemption. She wants it, but it's not just enough to want it. The person has to do the work, and you have to do the receiving. It's, it's this both and kind of coming into play, but, but the heavy lifting, if you will, is on the Goel's part, on the Redeemer's part, and that's exactly, exactly what Jesus has done. And so the first point of this was Boaz redeems Ruth. But now note this, and this is important. I didn't just write this down just because. The second point is this, Boaz marries Ruth. And we're going to come back to that. So Boaz redeems Ruth. The second point is Boaz marries Ruth. And you're like, wow, these points are so profound. (laughs) Just, Just hang on, hang with me. Look at verse 13. We don't know if there's like been a long chunk of time that has passed by where now they actually get married. I I tend to believe, and commenters, it's, it's all over the place, that the typical kind of fashion of how uh, a husband and a wife, uh, the, the, groom, uh, the, the bridegroom and the, the bride would come together in a, wear, a wedding ceremony, generally you're looking like nine months to a year for a variety of different reasons in that culture. But in this instance, I, I tend to believe that this was something that happened fairly quickly because redemption was taking place uh, kind of in that moment. Uh, but regardless, uh, the, verse 13, they get married. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Man, verse 13 is just, is just so, so, so good. This is the first time where we see where it says, so Boaz took Ruth, and this is where we don't see her referred to as Ruth from the land of Moab or Ruth the Moabitess. It's just wife. She's just his wife redeemed. That's her name. Friends, if you are in Christ, I don't know what your past was. And you you may have been a real scoundrel. I don't know. But what I know is this, is that you have been redeemed by the Goel. And that means that you are a son or daughter of the Lord. That's who you are. You may not feel that way, but I don't care about your feelings. I care about the truth of Scripture. And what the truth of Scripture says, you are redeemed, and you are not some sinner saved by grace. You were a sinner saved by grace, but now, according to Scripture, you are a saint of God. It's not reserved for the super elite people who just live their life like Mother Teresa or someone. It's for anyone who has come under the lordship of Jesus Christ. You are a saint redeemed by Jesus Christ. That's who you are. And so, and so what we find is, is this beautiful picture. Uh, I wrote it down. Uh, Ruth chapter 1, verse 22, she's known as a Moabitess. Ruth chapter 2, verse 10, a foreigner. Ruth chapter 3, verse 9, she's a maid. And then here, Ruth 4, 13, she's a wife. That's who she is. We also find that in this moment, I, I want to camp here for just a second, especially in light of the culture and time that we're in and the things that have been on the news. I just, I just want you to look at it. And it says, and he went into her, and look, the Lord enabled her to conceive. The Lord is the author of life and conception. So let us, let us not even be careful. Let us be warned that we think that we have the ability to define life. 
That is God's ability and His authority to define life and life at conception. Read Scripture and is blatantly clear that this is the Lord's work, Yahweh's work. And what you see is, again, the providential hand of God at work. The very, very first time, you don't have to turn there, but it's only a few pages to the left if you want to, but the very first time that the Lord Yahweh is even referenced in the book of Ruth is we see, it says, the Lord visited His people and giving them food. Giving them food. What, what did Ruth and Naomi need above all else? Food and family. Well, God, His unseen hand at work, He is the one who is going to give His people food. It's His job to give them the food. And then what we find here, the other great need that they have is not just food, but family. And now at this point, the Lord alone enabled Ruth to conceive. So there are two great needs of fa- food and family. God, yes, Boaz is used as a means and as just this wonderful servant to make it happen, but God is the one who is behind it. It's His work. So there may be some incredible people in your life that have done some incredible things in your life, but don't forget to give the credit and the worship and the glory to the one who is ultimately behind it all, and that is Yahweh. That is our God. Then the woman said to Na- the women said to Naomi, verse 14, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a Redeemer today, and may His name become famous in Israel. May He also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to Him. Seven, as you know, is like the, the number of perfection, and to have a son was just this big old deal. And it's like, no, 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 your daughter-in-law is better than having even seven sons. Like, this has been a true gift to you, this woman that is Ruth, the wife, not the Moabitess, the wife of Boaz, the one who has been redeemed. Um, I made this little note. I'll just read it to you. More than anyone else in the history of Israel, Ruth embodies the fundamental principle of the nation's ethic, which is Deuteronomy 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. But also Leviticus 19, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, is what Jesus says that the whole law and the prophets hinge upon these two great commandments. Love the Lord your God and love your, the neighbor, love your neighbor as yourself. That encompasses really the law. But what's interesting is in Leviticus 19.34, Moses, God really, instructs the Israelites to love the stranger as they love themselves. Why? Because God says you were once aliens and strangers in a strange land or Egypt. And ironically, it's this stranger from Moab, Ruth, who demonstrates to the Israelites what all of this actually means. Friends, part of what I think you can take with that is this. If you are in Christ by your faith and by His grace, if you are in Christ at a time, you were a foreigner, you were an adulterer, you were an alien, a stranger from God, the things of God, the people of God, the person of God, the grace of God. But because He pursued you to purchase you and to redeem you, you're no longer the alien or stranger, you're a part of His family and you get to receive that blessed inheritance. So remember who you are, but remember what you once were, so that when you see people who are living a life that you would say, that's certainly counter to what I believe as a child of God, how dare they, and I just want to throw things at them, just go, that's what I once was, and according to Scripture, I should demonstrate kindness and love to them, because that might just be what leads them to repentance, because is it not the kindness of God that leads them to repentance? Was it not the kindness, the chesed of God, the love of God that led you to repent? And then experience the grace of God, the mercy of God, and Him to become your Goel in your life. Finally, we come to the epilogue, verses 16 through 22. What we find here is this is the the makings of a lasting legacy. And we'll we'll just read the entirety of this section. Um, It says, that Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. The neighbor women gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi, so they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, and wouldn't you know it, he is the father of David, the king, until Jesus, (laughs) the king of Israel, like the guy. 
in God's providential hand through all of this is he is orchestrating a foreigner, an adulterer, all of those labels that she had, and she is in the lineage of David. And you go, that's incredible, but it gets better. So verse 18, now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron, to Hezron was born Ram, and to Ram, Aminadab, and to Aminadab was born Nashon, and to Nashon, Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz, and to Boaz, Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse, David. And then if you want to jump over to Matthew chapter 1, some of you know exactly where we're going, but you still need to see it because it's so good. Matthew chapter 1, we're about to get the lineage of Jesus, and we find in Matthew chapter 1 that exact same kind of run of things, but what we find is there's actually some other people here that are introduced even in the lineage of Jesus. We, there's that Aminadab. I just like saying that word, so you probably remember that one, so we'll start there. Ram was the father of Aminadab, verse 4. Aminadab was the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab, the harlot the prostitute. She's in the lineage of Jesus. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of David, the king. And then we come down here to the end, and it says, verse 16, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. They have no idea. There's so many times where I've said Ruth had no idea really what's going on behind the scenes. The idea that, that they could fathom that the king of Israel, David, would be their great-great-grandson, the, the, that doesn't even probably just even enter their mind. They're just, Ruth is just happy to be redeemed. <laughs> she's, just, she's just happy to not have to be working in the fields and gleaning as much. Like, like she, she just can't believe it. But then there's so much more that God has in store for them that there's going to be this lasting legacy that takes place. But it even gets better than that. This is the thing, I don't know what your life is going through right now, but if you will choose to follow the Lord, I'm not saying that everything is going to turn up roses this side of eternity, but what I will tell you is this, even though you will stumble, you will fall, you'll get beat up, and you will get bloodied, if, <laughs> when you choose to remain faithful to Christ and be unashamed of Him, whenever you finally, if you will, trip into eternity and that you die and that you go to be in His presence, you will look back and you have no idea that you'll go, man, all of the things in the tapestry that was weaved through in my, within my life, look at what it was able to accomplish. I hope and pray that we're not like those individuals that we read about in 1 Corinthians 3, where we bring our works and our life to God, though we are saved, and is tested with fire, and it gets burned up like wood, hay, and straw. And it's like, what you accomplish with your life, Christian, it was really just worthless. Or that our works that we live, not to get salvation, but because of salvation, they stand the test of God's judgmental fire like precious metal and stone. And when the fire comes to it, it's like, oh, there is a life that made an impact and a legacy. That's why, Christian, it matters how we live. Not for salvation, but because of salvation. And we will make an impact when we live that way. Okay. All of that, I got, I got at least 10 or 15 minutes. Some of you are like, you, you, no, you don't. But all of that, like as much as I love it, that's the story of Ruth. Tied, sealed, delivered, boom, take it, live it in your life. There's other stuff I could have shared about weddings and all that kind of stuff. But I, I wanted to leave time for this because this was something that God kind of showed me as I was studying this week that uh, I, I hope that it resonates with you in a way that it resonated with me because I, I just thought it was great. So Jesus is our go well. I think we can all agree with that. He's redeemed us. But, but here's the thing, and the reason why I made you take those notes and put them in your Bible is the order of things was this. Boaz redeems Ruth. Then he marries Ruth. Okay? Boaz first redeems Ruth, and then he marries Ruth. The beautiful picture within within the nation of Israel and their customs when it came to marriage, is that a goel, which really could be, a lot of times we talk about the goel in this sense, but it's also understood that a goel was like a man uh, coming into a woman's life, and even in a good family, good situation, not where there's like desperation, but if you will, bringing her into his family to live with his family and with his, in his father's house. 
That's the picture of an Old Testament or a, uh, or a New Testament even uh, uh, Israelite wedding and ceremony. But what had to happen in all those situations is redemption or purchase had to take place first. You don't just get married. And if I could just say a word for a second on marriage. Don't try to play marriage until you're married. Don't live together before you get married. Don't be intimate together until you get married. There is a proper order and ways that God has designed and, 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 and set up marriage to be for our best, for our good, and for his glory. And it's that we, we follow those order of things. And if we will follow the way that he designed it, it will go better for you. And what we have here is we have Boaz redeeming Ruth, then marrying her. I want you to, Dalton, do we have that, that first one, Revelation 5? I want you to just look at this with me. Some of you, if I, I got to preach the book of Revelation uh, one time, and it was just so much fun that maybe we'll do that at some point. But some of you may know that Revelation 5 is this moment where uh, in Revelation 4 and 5, is basically this huge worship service of people just gathered around the throne, just praising God for who He is and what He has done. And at this point in time, uh, there is a, a scroll with seals on it. And John is just heartbroken. The guy who wrote Revelation is just heartbroken because no one is worthy to take the scroll and to read it. And a lot of commenters believe that the scroll was the deed to the earth, that that's what the scroll is. Like, who has that? And what we find, and begin, because land is such a big part of the Goel process here in the book of Ruth, is this picture of when Boaz redeemed Ruth. Yes, he redeemed the person, but he also redeemed the land. And what we find is that finally there comes a point where the lion of Judah, who now we see is also the lamb, is someone who comes along and they begin to just praise the Lord for the fact that he can do this thing, that Jesus Christ is able to have the authority as the Goel to take the scroll, to receive the scroll, because he's earned the right as the Goel to be the one who is a relative, who has the means and the desire to redeem the land and to redeem the people. And so in verse 9, it says, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book, literally the, the scroll, and to break its seals, for you were slain, and this is the key word, purchased. That's the same word as goel, that's redeem. For you slain and redeemed, purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. He is the Redeemer. But note, He does this first. Now let's go to the end of Revelation. This is the end, right before Jesus returns. Many of you know just the Jewish imagery in Israelite wedding is that the bridegroom is going to come for His bride. They are betrothed. She has already been redeemed. Legally speaking, really, they're kind of married. They just haven't got to the ceremony and to the consummation part. But here we are at the end of Revelation. Jesus has redeemed his people. He's redeemed the church. He's redeemed people by the blood of the Lamb. But now, verse 7, chapter 19, let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Verse 8, it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9, then he said to me, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. He said it to me, these, word, these are true words of God. My question is, have you been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb? And the only way that you have is if you've been redeemed. You've got to be redeemed in order to be wed to Jesus Christ for eternity. I know that's kind of foreign to us, this idea of like, I thought I was already in Christ. You are in Christ but what we have is we have the inauguration of the kingdom of God, but we have not experienced yet the consummation of the kingdom of God. Another way to put it is we've experienced the justification of our faith and our salvation. We're experiencing the sanctification of our salvation, the process in which he's working out our salvation and our faith, but we're still longingly waiting for the moment of glorification of our salvation, that he has redeemed us and the promise is there to be realized and received. So he has redeemed you. The question is, is he coming for you as his bride? Have you received Christ? He's done all the work. Have you received him? And so if you would, with your head bowed, your eyes closed.
as Jesus has just done all of this work, the cross, the perfect life, the fulfillment of the law. Friend, I, I don't know how else to ask you other than, is Jesus your Goel? And is he coming for you? Because he's coming for his church. He's coming for the bride. And there's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. But is he coming for you? Are you a part of the bride of Christ? And don't, don't, don't make the assumption of, well, I grew up in church. I've heard the story. I've heard the gospel. Recognize that you have got to be redeemed before you get to be caught up with Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's an order to these things. He had to do the work. He had to do the sacrifice. He had to do the purchasing. He had to do the redeeming. Have you received him as your Goel, as your Redeemer? And for some of you, I've heard your story. I know that that's the case. I know that that's true. So maybe in just a moment, whenever we have a chance to, to respond, some of you are going to sing. But for others of you, who is that person in your life that is immediately coming to your mind right now? As we've talked about those that you live, work, and play with. That though they have heard of the truth of Jesus, they've never received him as their Goel. And that when the time comes, when Jesus returns and he is coming again, will they be received to the bridegroom? Will they be received to go out? As much as you want it, it doesn't matter how much you want it, it matters what he has done. Is he your Goel? So Father, I'm asking and praying that as we have a chance just to worship you as our Redeemer and the work and the sacrifice and the love of Jesus, that we would seize the opportunity and capitalize on it to examine our relationship with you and to see that it is there, that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys stand? Would you guys pray? Would you sing? You just do what the Lord would lead you to do in this time. If you'd like to visit with somebody, our elders are available. You can raise your hand. I'm right here. I'd love to visit with you. The worship.